Hello and welcome to this episode of Military History Inside Out. Today I speak with Stephen Bowd, who has written about mass murders during the Italian Wars from the end of the 15th century to about 1530. So thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with Stephen Bowd, author of Renaissance Mass Murder, Civilians and Soldiers During the Italian Wars. Thank you for speaking with me. That's right. Good to, good to speak to you. So first, tell me, how did you get into studying and writing on this subject? Um, it, it started off, I suppose, because I um, was interested in a, a small town, uh, a town in Italy, uh, northern Italy called Brescia, and I wrote a book about that in the Renaissance. And it was, it was a town that had been part of the Phoenician Empire. Um, so, uh, and then it was the site, it had been the site of a particularly uh, bloody massacre during the Italian wars. The city had been sacked and uh, reportedly thousands of civilians had been killed. Uh, and so I was asked by uh, a couple of uh, British historians to write an essay about uh, mass murder for a collection of essays uh, they were editing. Um, and so in the course of writing that essay, I suddenly realized there's a lot of other cases of mass murder of civilians during the Italian wars, and no one had seemed to uh, had written about them in a, a, as a whole. They, 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 they were sometimes mentioned specific, they mentioned figures, they said maybe, maybe a few thousand had died, uh, but that was sort of left and often left in the background of histories of the Renaissance, histories of Italy, even histories of the Italian wars don't tend to spend much time talking about all the civilians uh, who were killed. So I thought it was a good idea, a great idea, and I decided to expand the um, the essay into a book. Okay. And what, so what years does the, the book cover then? Uh, so it covers the, the invasion of Italy uh, by um, the French king in 1494. Um, and he was sort of encouraged by Italian powers to invade, particularly the Duke of Milan. Um, and then it goes up to right about 1530, when most of the fighting on the Italian peninsula between the French king, uh, the local powers, the emperor, uh, the Germans, the Spanish and so on, moved elsewhere, mostly moved off I I Italian soil, although it continued a little bit in the area called Piedmont, in the northwest of Italy. So I thought that was a good, that, that seemed to me a, to a good point to which to, 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 to drink, draw the book to a close. Mm -hmm. So how is the book broken down? Do you go chronologically or do you... Um... No, no, um, no, it's um, broken down into, I'm just, uh, just need to remind myself. Uh, so what I do is I start off by talking about the practices of mass murder. So I'm really interested in uh, how it began, how, how events of mass murder erupted in particular places at particular times. So what was the mechanism? Uh, what, what were the reasons behind uh, uh, these events taking place? Looking at it from the point of view of uh, the soldiers, I suppose, first of all. So what, it, what was it they were interested in getting out of these uh, massacres? And then I look at, the, look at it from the point of view of the civilians. So trying to understand their practical lived experience of uh, of these marauding armies. So that's the first section. Then the second section, I go into the theories. There's a lot of theories, you know, which justify uh, extreme behavior in war, as you probably know. There's all sorts of, you know, whether it's the modern term collateral damage, for example, which is uh, armies will accept as, as, as necessary, as, um, as um, something which is uh, unavoidable in warfare. So I was interested in looking at whether we find in the Renaissance similar theories which justify and excuse um, the, ma the mass murder of civilians. And they're there, there's plenty, there's plenty of them. And then in the final section, I look at how uh, incidents of mass murder were represented in poetry. So the poetry of war, uh, often written by soldiers, some of it written by the civilians themselves. In art, of course, the Renaissance is well known as a period of great flourishing in art and artistic production. So I was interested to see if any of these events were reflected in the art of the period, helped shape the art of the period. 
Um, and uh, so, and then I compare, I sort of then put the Bass murder in context of genocidal acts through history uh, and try to understand, to try to see if it fits into some of the models that uh, discussions we've had about genocide, uh, which have particularly arisen since uh, obviously latter part of the 20th century. So how many events do you uh, end up covering in this book? How many different um, episodes, say? Well, there in, in the book, I, I think I identify, oh, I don't know. I, I didn't, I've never counted them all up. I, I have a table with the main events, the main reported events. So there's probably a, a dozen, a couple of dozen, something like that over this period. Those are the ones that, you know, th there's most evidence of single concentrated events of mass murder. Uh, but beneath, but beyond that, there's the there are a lot of um, sort of local, you know, lots of local smaller incidents which were taking place uh, you know, uh, all through the period. So, how many of these um, were all these massacres incident to some kind of military activity, or did some fall between periods of military activity? It's, it's an it's a interesting point. I think yes, both. Um, some are associated with sieges. So um, at the end of a siege, maybe three months, say on average in the Renaissance, the Italian wars, a couple of months, three months, um, the uh, besiegers might get into the city, and um, they had a sort of right to sack the city. Uh, because they defeated it, they were victorious in arms, um, and civilians might were, would usually resist this, and so inevitably this would lead to violence. Um, and so, in, a t in the course of military ordinary military operations, there would mass murder took place. It was understood it would take place. It helped, as I say, helped subjugate cities. It also helped to punish them, and it was a way of uh, setting an example for other towns further down the road. You know, to say, if you don't surrender immediately to our army, we will treat you as harshly as we treated this town. So that's quite acceptable. Between, and, and then, yeah, between, uh, I suppose, warfare in the Italian wars where bur concentrated bursts of activity and warfare in particular parts of the peninsula. So um, there were large, there were large parts of the peninsula that were untouched by these activities. Um, but I think the that the, the, there was not so much a clear distinction between um, the, the the periods of peace and war, perhaps as we might think. And that occupying troops, for example, would could cause a great deal of devastation uh, just through their occupation. It wasn't necessarily sort of active military engagement, but it was part of the process of them passing through, perhaps retreating back to their own countries or uh, being welcomed in and being resident in a particular town or uh, state in Italy, but nevertheless behaving with violence. Uh, and this often, the, the relations between civilians and soldiers uh, deteriorate, could deteriorate um, very badly. So how much of a sense was there that civilians were maybe off limits unless they did something? Or was it basically, if you're not one of us, we can kill you if we feel yeah. like it. I, I, my sense is that civilians are fair game. Um, there's, a, there's a feeling that, uh, there's a sense that civilians are, um, uh, in a sense, inferior to soldiers. I think there's often, with some of the, the, the military groups, the German Landsknechts, for example, who have a very strong sense of esprit de corps and their uniforms and uh, in their sort of training, they have a very arrogant, they're often depicted as having a very arrogant attitude towards civilians, and they see them and they see them all as fair game, whatever they're doing, whatever side they're supposed to be on. And of course, no one with civilians, it's very difficult or impossible for soldiers to tell who's on which side. As far as they're concerned, they're all potential enemies. They're all people who could potentially aid their enemies by whether it's through fighting, turn, you know, picking up arms, as many peasants do and with quite alarming effects. There's lots of stories of uh, peasants uh, sort of uh, mutilating, uh, uh, tracking down and mutilating, ambushing and mutilating uh, soldiers 
so these soldiers passing through, often passing through a hostile country, would have viewed everyone with suspicion. Uh, but even even if there was, a, even if they knew they were friendly-ish, many soldiers desperate for uh, basic goods, pay, and money, booty, and other things would probably turn on civilians and could cause harm to them. Because an effective way, the most effective way of extracting booty and ransom is basically to throw someone off a, a roof or a height, which might harm them but not kill them. But obviously, uh, it could often kill them uh, if they didn't calculate it uh, correctly. So yeah, they're all they're all fair game, I would say. So you sort of answered my next question, but um, were most most of these incidents um, foreign? foreign troops against Italians, or was there much of Italian well, against Italian? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because um, the, as I said, I, I described the French coming in, invading Italy as if, you know, there was a, a very strong uh, national uh, division. Well, in fact, there are Italians fighting in the French army, uh, and there are French who joined the Italian armies, and then the Germans and Spanish are involved. And again, you find a mixture of uh, nationalities in all the armies. So, for example, when I looked at the Spanish army records in Simancas in Spain, I found records, lists of uh, members of, of, of squadrons, and it included Italian names. So they may well have been passing through and fighting with their fellow uh, Italians. But of course, Italy at this time is a divided uh, place. It's not a uni unified nation. So there are already these sort of uh, hostility, uh, hostility existing between, say, Florence and Venice, for example. And so they found themselves on opposite sides on occasions. So it's a real mix. Um, and it's that's interesting because uh, sometimes people have wondered whether these explosions of mass murder are related to national nationalist hostilities, you know, to chauvinism or some other kind. Um, and it, I don't think it's so much that as perhaps uh, at an army level, but at a squadron level. What, what I see is that what I found was that um, at the squadron level, um, these squadrons were often of one nation or one region. So for example, Gascon squadrons or uh, uh, and so on had, had a tight, very tight knit, very strong sense of identity and they would often act independently of the general uh, in order to reap benefit for their own squadron. And they seem to work very effectively and be particularly violent and lead the charges into towns and, uh, and lead uh, the massacres and so on. So, so it works. So nationality is important, more important at that level, I think, than the national army, than any national army level, which doesn't really exist in effect. Mm -hmm. Um, so when an enemy army is, say, coming through a town, I, I get the feeling that the rich citizens could move themselves out and protect themselves, and it's essentially the middle class and poor who suffer. That's mm -hmm. my guess. Um, is that the situation, or how does that work? Well, I've, I think the best evidence for that, I, I mean, perhaps, is um, the records of the, 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 the plunder that's taken, the, the ransoms and the plunder that's taken. And there are records of, uh, of this, which, which, which indicate the occupation and status and wealth of the people who were held to ransom. Uh, some of them were violently attacked, as I said, thrown off roofs and, uh, and so on. And um, that's one indicator. That indicates that actually the rich are there. There are, there are some quite wealthy people uh, 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 among those who are captured or taken ransom. My feeling is that either the rich were caught up in sieges and didn't have time to escape, so they form part, they, they, they take a part in the town, um, or um, they didn't wish to escape, they wanted to stay in towns and preserve their wealth from looters, for example, and uh, they, this was the best place for them. Um, or, uh, you know, so I don't get a sense that the wealthy necessarily escape. And of course, the most famous example of this is in the sack of Rome in 1527. That's the, the, the most famous sack of the Italian wars um, uh, and supposed to be one of the most murderous. 
Uh, but a lot of the letters from the sack of Rome or describing the sack of Rome do describe uh, the very wealthy being targeted. Cardinals, for example, who are incredibly wealthy people at this time, are losing apparently thousands and thousands of ducats and uh, paintings and their finery and so on. And there's a sort of series of letters written by Isabella d'Este, the Duchess of uh, Mantua, who was in Rome and took into her palace in, in Rome lots of very rich noble people in refuge. They were just totally taken by surprise, I think, uh, by the, the, the turn of events. And so this, this, this is not uncommon. People are just totally surprised or, or, or taken unawares by this often, mm -hmm. including the wealthy. So considering the, the theories about this that you researched, yeah. um, was there any sense that uh, maybe you have mercy on the enemy so that they have mercy on you if, if situations change? Or it, it feels like it was just a free for all of destruction and, and killing and plundering. It's, 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 yeah, I mean, um, there is, yeah, certain, certain parts of it is a free for all, but, um, to, to a large extent, perhaps more than you might expect, it is a coordinated and organized and structured event. So there are certain stages you have to go through, for example, with the siege, uh, you know, that, 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 that allows you, the, that, that gives the siege validity. And then it gives the validity to the plunder that takes place once um, the town surrender is taken by force. Um, and I think there is an under it's completely understood uh, by the, the the commanders that civilians will be harmed in the course of this. And indeed, there are deliberate instructions given, or commands given, or plans made for the killing of civilians. So the act, a strat what I call the strategy of terror that the French particularly use early on. Uh, and then as they encounter lots of garrisons, fortified garrisons in Italy, um, and the, the, so the strategy of terror is quite effective there. That's now the, these garrisons are obviously full of soldiers, but they, it's quite clear that they're also uh, used by civilians for protection. People flock to the garrisons for protection and defence and in hope of safety as armies appear. And so the problem is they end up being collateral damage in that sense. So at that early stage, I suppose, civilians are collateral damage as part of this organised military effort. Later on, they're deliberately targeted as the armies encounter all of these very wealthy, highly populated urban centres in Italy. Italy is the most urban, uh, apart from the low countries, the most heavily urbanised and wealthiest area of Europe at this time. Uh, so there's no coincidence that we have uh, these sacks of cities and these violent sacks of cities by uh, these armies hungry for wealth. Hmm. It's almost like the barbarians are still sacking Italy. Well, this is what they, this is, they were always comparing them to the, the ancient, the, the medieval, the early medieval barbarians. They're always saying the French, but they go further than that. They say the French are worse than Attila and the Huns uh, because they say at least Attila and the Huns didn't rape our women, didn't desecrate our churches, so it's claimed. And that's the accusation made against the Germans, the, the French and so on, that they have no shame, they have no, no religious morality at all. Um, but of course, the Italians would say that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that there were some pre-planned uh, massacres, but uh, among the events you studied, how did it break down as, as far as maybe spur of the moment versus planned? Um, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, um, I tried, it's obviously there's only so far you can go because the sources can be conflicting, depending, you know, if you're a victim or a uh, you're a survivor or you're on which side you're on. Um, it's, um, some of them seem to be spur of the moment, prompted by, uh, it's interesting, often prompt, often squadrons of, of, of troops, individual squadrons, troops defying orders or worried that they see that peace talks are underway and that these peace talks mean they will lose their share of booty because the peace talks and a settled peace usually means less booty. And it means booty which will go directly to the general 
and not who will who's supposed to use it to pay troops or distribute it fairly but this very rarely happens and so i think the soldiers would be you know watching the scanning the horizon as it were watching what their commanders were doing or listening to rumors about peace possible peace and if they felt that peace was in, imminent they might attack uh, they might also spur the moment also seems to sometimes happen in reaction to insults uh, or uh, in defense of honor um, so for example at one in one town uh, it's rumored that the local inhabitants have, have poisoned the wine have poisoned the local wells and as a way of uh, harming the troops harming the soldiers and so the soldiers sort of uh, sack the town violently they murder a lot of civilians in as this kind of uh, tit for tat as a kind of reaction uh, to 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 that or they might be reacting to the, the, the civilians uh, taking to arms and throwing rocks down from walls on them and attacking them and so on. And that, that it could be one, it sometimes it's reported one small incident could, could provoke that, even, even words, an exchange of, 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 of insulting words could lead to uh, an attack. So yeah, some of them are planned, but yeah, you have these incidents of, of, of spur of the movement violence. Um, how how is the violence um, generally committed? Was it you know clubs, swords, guns, you know, and does it even matter? It matters. It does matter. This is a period when we're told when we're always talking about technological developments. You know, the military revolution, which includes you know, the development of the muskets, for example, and the 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 the, the, the better drilling and org and training of troops to use these these, these more. Uh, the, these types of ballistic weaponry. But um, really, I, I found that the, that the military revolution in that sense didn't, didn't, wasn't a key factor in, in the violence, that, that what the troops are doing is they're either using their daggers and close, daggers and swords in close combat, uh, as they would do, as they've done for centuries, uh, centuries uh, or they were uh, throwing, as I've said, throwing people from great heights. And in Italian towns, there's lots of, because there's a lot of tall buildings, fortified, tall fortified buildings and so on in Italian towns of the period. There's lots of opportunities for throwing people from great heights. Belfries, for example, church towers are used. One priest describes how he was thrown from a church tower and on the way down by a soldier and on the way down, he prayed to God for intervention and was saved uh, and landed in a, in a sort of soft like, heap of hay or something and survived. And, and as I've said, this is, this is cheap and easy. This is a quick, cheap, easy way of dealing with people, threat, either threatening them to extract ransom or simply eradicating them, killing them. Because mm -hmm. I, I read through some of the events I think you discussed and the numbers of people killed, uh, you know, I guess between hundreds and then sometimes thousands. Yeah. That takes time and effort, yeah. you know, with your hands to kill that many people, you know. Yeah, I would say the fi the figures; those are the reported figures. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I it's 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 there. What we need is really good archaeological evidence. So what we need to find are the mass graves, for example, uh, and the, the, they've been one or there's been a few mass graves excavated in English, near English battle sites like Towton. Um, but those are of mass graves of soldiers. Uh, but mass graves of civilians, unfortunately, we don't, haven't been excavated. So those would really give us a lot of, a good idea of how many were killed, uh, how they were killed, you know, evidence of breakage and stabbing and so on would be really interesting. My feeling is with those figures is I, I always think you need to divide them by 10. By a factor of ten, I think what they were doing, and all whenever they, whenever they give these figures of thousands and thousands, they they're just giving an impression of lots of people. They just want to give, they just want to convey the message: lots of people died. Mm -hmm. But but the, when we do have evidence of numbers, more precise evidence, for example, there's a really lovely, there's amazing diary entry where someone describes the burial of the dead after a massacre, and he describes. How, how many bodies could fit on the cart that took them from the site of massacre to burial and how many times the
a sense there of a, of a plausible calculation of this. That's, that's, in that case, it's 250 bodies. And interestingly enough, there are two chroniclers who say, give the same number elsewhere. So, you know, I'm very cautious. I'm always very cautious about these figures, but in at least what, you know, in some cases, they seem to have been right. These numbers were huge. And that's not counting the people who die of the disease in the days and weeks and months afterwards, because these 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 events caused huge uh, disruption, and of course, having rotting corpses lying around is 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 a really uh, it just encourages disease spread of disease. Mm -hmm. So there all those deaths need to be accounted for to include those. I haven't included those really mm -hmm. so much. So before we turn to uh, the resources you use for the research, um, are there any other themes or issues in the book that we haven't touched on that you want to mention? I think I think we've um, touched on the one, the, the really the ones that, that really struck me: the, the, the deliberate strategy of terror, uh, the calculation, as well as the improvis improvisatory nature uh, of the um, uh, of the, the civilians of the, the, the experiences. I'd also say that um, what struck what also struck me was the role of women in all of these events. And there's some interesting sources describing women drilling and dressed as soldiers and drilling and taking up arms in, uh, as civilians in defense of their uh, of their cities and towns and slots. So that, that that was something that was new to me. I, uh, that was interesting to me. And there's a lot of commentary about this uh, at the time, a lot of people saying, noting this and uh, noting it's quite a, a significant um, development. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, so as far as the resources you used, where did you find your, um, you know, your all the documents you used? Well, I started off to, what I did was um, I started off looking at, there's a lot of printed diaries and chronicles Obviously, in Italy, it's a very, it's a relatively highly literate society in the Renaissance. So a lot of lawyers and notaries and doctors and uh, locals are writing, scribbling down uh, observations about their local area on all of these uh, uh, towns across Italy, mainly central northern Italy. We don't know, we don't have so many sources from the south of Italy. One, I found one chronicle from Sicily. But south of Naples, very I found very little. That's that was a that was a difficulty for me. Um, uh, so I looked at those, and they were all. I would just want to mention um, the Institute of Historical Research in London has an amazing library, and I spent a lot of time in there. And all these chronicles were up on their shelves, and you just I just pulled them down and I worked through them all. It was just a, a wonderful experience as a researcher to do that. And I didn't know. I didn't really know. When I started looking, whether I'd find a lot of of evidence in these diaries and chronicles, but actually, as it turned out, there was a huge amount, very little, almost nothing had ever been. No one had ever really paid any attention to it. So that was really wonderful. And then once I once I'd looked at all the printed stuff, I went to Italy and I looked at all the. Um, I went to, visited all the towns that had been massacred or sacked. And I went to the archives in each of those towns and I dug out things like compensation claims, burial records, um, letters from soldier, French soldiers' home that had been seized, for example, um, a whole range of really interesting sources, unpublished sources in manuscript. Because of course, Italy is, is an, for me, a researcher on Italian history, it's an amazing place because they do have so many manuscripts and evidence and materials that you, that you can work with and, and generally quite well, pretty well organized in a state archive, in their state archive system. Hmm. How about your language skills? Did you have any um, difficulties with any of the languages? Not. Uh, I was a bit worried. I went to Spain um, to look at the Spanish military archives from the period. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I was a little bit worried about that, that whether my Spanish, I, I, I've never really learned Spanish. And so I was a bit worried about my, my Spanish holding up. Well, in the first place, the, the staff there understood Italian. Uh, so I was okay, I was okay with that. And then reading, reading the Spanish of the period, actually it's not, 
there's not such a, a big difference between the Spanish and the Italian of the period, which with which I'm used to, I'm used to reading that. So that 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 was fine. There were some challenges with um, the poetry. Some of it's written in a very sort of humanist Latin, uh, which can be quite difficult to translate. It's quite tricky. And other, some of it is also written in a local dialect or vernacular, um, and that can that can be very tricky. And I chose not to try and translate that into poetic English, but just to translate it into a, a readable prose, um, which I kind of I think is I think was the best choice. I don't think I wanted to inflict my bad poetry or, as it were, my bad poetic translation. I'll leave that to my brother. <laughs> So, um, how about, did you mention church records or how about the Vatican? Do you think they'd have uh, it? Yeah, I, I, the church, I, church records, I came across one interesting one, uh, a, a false insurance claim made by, by some monks who claimed they'd lost thousands of ducats of goods in a sack, but it turned out to, that there's a note on the claim saying this is all a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid the... The, although the church was great and it, it gave refuge to people, churches were where people gathered and hid in their strong walls and, and, and strong doors. Uh, they, they weren't always uh, completely honest about uh, their activities. There are, um, I mean, in the Vatican archives, there are, there are materials relating to the sack of Rome. Um, those, though, have been very well used and studied. The sack of Rome, there have been th at least three books, four books, specialist books on the sack of Rome itself, because it's it's Rome and, 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 and people are, you know, want to want to. So I didn't I decided I made a decision not to make use of those, although the Vatican's a wonderful, is a superb place to work. It's very well resourced, as you might expect, and it's very incredibly well organized. But I decided I thought, well, there's already and actually in my book, I deliberately wanted to sort of move away, move focus away from the sack of Rome, just because it has had so much attention already and move on to the other, all the other cases. So that was a, a sort of deliberate uh, decision. Um, and you touched briefly on archeological evidence. Yeah. Is, is there anything of use for your research? I, I looked, um, there's not no there, there there i've i've not i didn't come across anything uh really it's i had school of history classics and archaeology at edinburgh so i had some uh, some really useful discussions with my colleagues in archaeology about this uh, but they weren't they directed me to the Towton battle uh excavations uh, which are really interesting. Uh, really interesting in terms of also in how divergent, as much as historians, archaeologists can be in in the, in, dis in judging what all the evidence means. So the Towton burial, on the one hand, it's described by some archaeologists as likely to be a, a site of a mass murder. A whole set of other archaeologists looking at the same evidence say, no, 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 no. It's 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 just a normal burial. Um, so even if you find archaeological evidence, it's hard. It's obviously incredibly hard uh, to interpret. So that that would be, I, I, yeah, I would have liked to have looked at some, but I just didn't find any that in Italy that was relevant. So if anyone knows, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, what what part of the research was most enjoyable for you? Um, let me think. What was most enjoyable? I think visiting the sites, I think you know, going to the, the places where all this happened and going into the archives and what you find and you find unexpected things. I mean, that's 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 a great pleasure. And there's also, I think, a great pleasure in talking to the local people, archivists about this. And of, of, often for them, uh, these incidents are um, incredibly important in their local history. You know, for locally, they're really important, and often you'll find there are local books written about them or celebrate, you know, commemorations of them, and so on. So it was really interesting engaging with that and, and, and meeting people who really, and they they were very interested in what I was uh, trying to do. Although obviously, for some people, I found it quite a repellent, slightly repellent. 
yeah. topic, which is understandable. Yeah, it is quite uh, grim. You mentioned before um, that you did find a lot of um, a lot of writing had been done, um, contemporary writing on civilian massacres. It's interesting that only now are we looking into that, considering how important it seems yeah. considered it then. Yeah, it's 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 I'm we're looking. It's important, you know. We're looking at it now. I think partly because we're living through another age in which civilian in sieges and civilian massacres are are, are in the forefront of the news. So Aleppo, uh, Sirte, uh, you know, these places, Syria has been a war of sieges and civilian massacres often. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that that's that I think that's partly why uh, it's become of greater interest. And of course, more jet broadly, I suppose, in the 20th century, because of uh, strategic nuclear weaponry, uh, civilians are in the front line, as it were. And generally, there's been an interest in, in among historians, as, as many as, of course, you'll know, in home, the home front and in, in the civilian experience of war. And I think, but I think there's because of the way warfare has developed, there's there's particular reasons why the civilian has come you know, very much to the fore and been re, you know, the civilians of the of the Italian wars now are being rediscovered. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned you were surprised about uh, women being trained. Was there anything else uh, that surprised you in your research? It surprised me. Um, I think, yeah, I think what's, I think what surprised me, another element that surprised me was how persistent the excuses and justifications for the massacres of civilians are. And I use present tense. Yeah, you know, we're often, you know, I, I went into this not perhaps naively thinking, oh, well, Geneva, you know, vaguely thinking, well, we've got the Geneva Convention and there's all the Union Convention of the Rights of the Civilian or, uh, or People in War and so on. But we've, we've got all these things. This is, this is surely established a long time ago that civilians were protected, were a protected group. Not at all. Um, we may have moved away from the Renaissance when the civilians had a negative connotation, uh, the way they were described and, uh, and the terms that were used, often negative terms. But um, this change, which is supposed to have happened in the 17th and even 18th centuries, where the civilian becomes this protected group, doesn't really happen. It's still, you know, the, the justification for killing civilians is still there way into the 17th, 18th centuries, late 18th centuries. Uh, and so someone as famous as uh, you know, Hugo Grotius, Grotius is supposed to have developed you know, this idea of warfare in which the civilian is protected to some extent. He, even he's saying, no, 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 there's, there's civilians, there's, there are all these circumstances in which civilians can be killed. And basically it's often along the lines of, well, if it is military necessary, if it is militarily necessary. And as far as I can see, that's not changed that much. The language is slightly different, uh, collateral damage, but but it's in there, it's there. Um, so, uh, so you know, so, so that 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 perhaps through my ignorance, naivety, uh, I found you know I found quite surprising that it was so that, that, that this this kind of the, this has been so persistent. It's a very interesting connection between the century and the concept. Between the the centuries. You know, yeah. the military necessity just, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there may be military people who, would, would, if I said this to them, would laugh and say, well, of course, you know, this is not, this is not news to us. And uh, I've, been I've been listening too much. The theorists, you know, they're, they're, obviously there is a whole panoply of rights and, uh, and protections uh, that were developed, especially after the Second World War, um, but uh, um, but the, the the states have found ways around this. They found ways of reclassifying what they're they're doing, and and the so-called new wars, which involve guerrilla tactics or you know remote uh, killing, killing by uh, remote mechanisms and so on, doesn't always, as you know, distinguish <laughs> with a hundred percent. Uh, accuracy between a civilian and a combatant. How do you? This is 
question that has been raised. How can people tell from a silhouette through down a TV screen at such great distance whether this person is hostile or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, what was there a particular question um, that was very difficult to come to a conclusion on? I, I know considering the sources, there's many questions, but yeah. was there any that really held on to you that, that took a lot of your time and energy? To, 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 yeah, to get to the, to the bottom of, um, uh, what was the trickiest? I think, um, I think one of the things that was trickiest, I, I've got a whole chapter in the book on uh, Machiavelli. Mm. Uh, so, you know, well known, still read as the author of The Prince, which is this presented as this, this handbook for cynical statesmen, you know, how to behave, appear outwardly virtuous while uh, all the time scheming uh, uh, and achieving your ends. I think one of the things which I found trickiest to pin down was Machiavelli's view of, of, of murder of civilians, actually, and interestingly enough. He's, in some ways, he, uh, I, think, I, think to, I think in the end, I would say that he was a realist in the sense that he recognized that massacres of civilians were a part of war. They, this kind of violence was just something that that's what happened. This is what happens when states grow and clash and so on. But I would say that in the end, he's not he's not someone who's advocating survival of the fittest or dog eat dog. He's looking for a framework which will check put these ten, these which will put into tension or check these destructive forces. Otherwise, you know, of civil civil and military. Otherwise, as he rightly sees it, society will pull itself apart. So society will end, will end up living in a desert, or in, you know, there'll be um, deserted, uh, uninhabited countries who have destroyed themselves because they've allowed their military to run amok. So I think that's that was very difficult, partly because of the way he writes. He writes in a very playful, elliptical a seemingly contradictory way at times and so really teasing out what he's doing there the thread of his argument that was a, that was for me a big challenge i'm not sure whether i've succeeded in doing that in the chapter but i think i got i, I think i got a bit further a bit closer to understanding mm -hmm. his view of mass murder mm -hmm. which i hope will be of interest to people interested in machiavelli oh yeah yeah um was there anything you came across that emotionally moved you in some ways, either positively or negatively? Yeah, I'd say negatively. Uh, what happened uh, was that um, when I first started reading through these uh, accounts of mass murder events, um, they did have an impact. I was, I did, I did have nightmares. I was, I was sleeping very oddly. It was a very strange. It was very strange. They did because I was just reading these day after day after day, and so many of them. Uh, which hadn't happened before. So that, that was a, a, a negative impact. Um, a positive impact, um, you mean emotionally? Yes. Something uh, that made you particularly happy, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> just, I'm a bit just... worried about saying there was something out of this topic which made me, that, that made me particularly happy. Um, um, I'd say what, I think what made me particularly happy was that it was an opportunity for me to write about the mass of ordinary people. So... I'm really, really keen that this I under I, I, that, that that people when they read the book get a sense of what's going on from the point of view of the ordinary person in the path of war. Uh, too often in the past, the civilian had just been they'd been a nameless group, and they're described in num reduced to a number. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're kind of collapsed this this collapsed down. So I was really keen to to reconstruct and rescue individual life stories. So I'm, I, where I can, I name the individual civilian and try and say something about their experience of being thrown off a roof. And we have, you know, to extract ransom, for example, and we have account, first-hand accounts of those. So that sort of thing is wonderful to find for me. And it's wonderful to sort of present them in that way and to reconstruct, even try to reconstruct a kind of emotional life and reaction and how they're dealing with it, which is not always easy. Um, people don't always write about their emotions in the Renaissance. 
in quite the same way we do. But I, I think I was able to, to go some way to do that. So that for me, that was very satisfying. Mm -hmm. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, you know, when you think of that period, you always think that people are very religious then, um, you know, and yet you have these things going on and it, yeah. you know, it just makes you think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and religion play, you know, it plays some interesting roles in the events. You know, there, there, there's, I told you, you know, as I said, churches are refuges, um, but uh, there's no, the, there's no sense that priests or religious figures are spared this. They are all in it together. Uh, so that was quite striking to find out. Would you say there was any kind of Protestant Catholic divide among the events or did that not even seem to matter? No, that's a, that's a, it's an interesting point because it's often, it's often said that at the sack of Rome the German troops, one of the reasons they were so violent or so distracted was because many of them were Lutheran, were Protestant. And so they took the, they saw Rome as a sort of uh, seat of the Antichrist, of Antichrist, the Pope to them. They've been told by Luther that the Pope is Antichrist, was Antichrist. So they took great pleasure, it's said, in scrawling Luther's name on Raphael's frescoes and so on and so forth. But equally, the Catholic Church took great pleasure in tarring the German soldiers as Protestants. And so you, there's a kind of a problem. Uh, my, my, uh, my sense, my feeling is that there may well have been Protestants in the army, but I think it, it, was, it, it, it was convenient to the, 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 the Roman victims and the church to maybe exaggerate uh, that, that, the, 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 the role of, those, of Protestantism and religion in, in, in that sense. That's my hunch. I'm sure there'll be lots of people who say I'm completely wrong, but um, that's my feeling. It's been somewhat exaggerated, uh, some of these stories about uh, the, 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 the religious antagonism. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope the book will do? Well, I think what, so what I hope it will do is, first of all, um, make people who look at the Italian wars think about the civilians more, keep them in mind when they're writing about what was, what's, what was going on at the time. Um, I hope it'll also be, uh, it'll remind people who write about Renaissance Italy that while they're looking, you know, while Raphael or Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo are working on their art, doing all these things, sculpture and art, that there's all this violence going on it, 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 right around them. And indeed, they're often involved in this violence. Michelangelo is uh, involved in military fortifications, for example. Raphael is based in Urbino when he's, a, when he's young, and that was a centre for the gathering of troops. And it, it, many of his early sketches are of soldiers. And I, I think, I hope it reminds people who write about Renaissance Italy that this is, this is an incredibly violent period in which the, the presence of troops the, the, the sight of dead bodies is not that uncommon, that it does happen. And this, how, I want them to ask themselves, how does this, uh, how did this impact on the Renaissance? How did this shape the debates about humanity and the debates about what it was to be a human? Uh, how did it shape artistic production? An artistic production which often dwells on the naked body, the nude body, the musculature of the nude body and so on. How did, how did this dismemberment and bodily disaggregation uh, impact on, on, on that world? So it's not all about, Renaissance isn't all about harmony. And uh, this is, you know, the third man, you know, we have the, the speech given by Orson Welles, as Harry Lyne, saying, you know, what thought the, the, the Swiss have had 500 years of peace and love and goodwill and what have they given us, the cuckoo clock, the Italians had the Borgias uh, 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 and so on and war, constant warfare and they gave, they gave us the Renaissance. So there's, there's an interesting connection between this, this, this terrible violence and, uh, and the cultural impact. So I think those two mainly areas, those two main areas are one side want to affect. Hmm. Actually, you, your answer kind of raised a question I didn't ask before, which is how often did one of these 
events actually achieve the goal, you know, like ending resist military resistance or or did it, it, just... it does. It does. It is effective. So um, one of the earliest massacres uh, is uh, followed by effectively the surrender of Florence. Uh, they they hear they hear the reports that one of their outposts or garrisons is massacred. Um, this is a sort of, I think it's it has a huge psychological effect. There's that sets a panic. You know, it really it really makes it's a demonstration of ruthlessness. Um, and so I think that that undermines the confidence of some of the, the, the rulers. And so, for example, as I said, Florence decides to come to a sort of agreement with the French rather than sit behind its garrisons and its fortified places and hope and, and hope they can tough it out. So it does, and you know, and, and that's one example. There are other examples. It's not necessarily that the French or others had superior technology. The Italians had very good technology. And indeed, I think their fortifications are a lot better. Everyone says, oh well, their fortifications weren't that great and they were and they needed to be reinforced later in the 16th century. I don't think that's entirely true at all. I think a lot of what's going on is it's a psychological warfare. It's very effective, as of course many generals, many leaders have used uh, have found it was some of the most effective, have found it using the mind. Mind games work just as well, if not better, than a show of for than, than the actual force. Mm -hmm. hmm. So can you speak to any difficulties you had in finishing the book and getting it published and how you over overcame those? Um, the book, well, the book, I have to say, it, it, it was, um, it, it, I, it, I, wrote, I wrote it very uh, easily, actually. Um, it came together very easily. I think the most difficult parts were the, the, the Is what he was thinking, and perhaps uh, the, the 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 chapter on poetry was quite difficult. It was like you know we've got a phrase in a British phrase called nailing jelly to a wall, and it's uh, which is I don't know if that's an American phrase, but yeah. but 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 it's the idea of trying to of something that's so kind of difficult to handle, putting trying to get it into shape, trying to uh, to, to, to and 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 I think trying to organise a chapter on the poetry of war uh, for the Italian wars was a bit like that, drawing out themes. I got there eventually, but that, that was really tough. And then all I did was I submitted, um, I thought about, um, I sort of looked at the finished product, the manuscript, and I thought about where, where it would likely work best as a book. So I just, I got in touch with Oxford University Press and they were interested. I sent it to them and they fairly quickly said they, they, the, the, the readers that they sent it to liked it. And they, they suggest a couple of changes, but nothing major. And so mm -hmm. after that, it was very smooth, very smooth indeed. Nice. Um, what's your next writing project? Uh, mm. I've just finished this one. <laughs> There's been, people have written about courage, written a lot about courage. I'm quite interested in writing about cowardice because it's a theme which emerged in this book in that, um, that, 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 that the civilians obviously are often characterised as cowards, uh, that they're described as turning tail and running uh, on their heels. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of, some of the soldier narratives also, also talk about, well, not, some of the narratives also talk about fear and emotions, the emotion of fear. Uh, and, and I'm quite interested in that. That seems to me to be maybe a slightly more neglected, you know, courage everyone wants to talk about, the cowardice perhaps uh, less so, and perhaps that appeals to me as <laughs> someone who probably wouldn't be uh, very effective, uh, uh, competent. Well, I would say you know, the concept of fear is still interesting, even if it didn't lead you to run away, you know, yeah. you still fought on, yeah. just those feelings. Yeah. There's a, there's a, yeah, there's a nice discussion by one of the six, one of the Renaissance writers, and he talks about the feelings, he can contra it's about the, the, the fear of death. And he says, he, he says that, that, that people fear death less in the midst of a battle than at home 
dying in bed. And he says it's this sense that in the midst of a battle, you're with all these other people in the same position as you. Uh, whereas when you're at home in bed, you're alone, that's it. In, in the sense, you're the one there face to face with death. And so it's quite, I thought that was quite a, a striking and unusual sort of meditation discussion of these feelings. And I, I'd be quite, you know, it'd be interesting to see if there was any, uh, anything more like that. So that's one idea. Yeah. Makes me, Marcus Aurelius, pops into you know meditations comes to mind just thinking about that subject well i'll go i should i i'll look at that because obviously i should now broaden my historical scope from from the renaissance it's uh, something much much bigger and this can be a history of fear throughout the ages i'm sure there's plenty of material oh yeah <laughs> so where can people find um your work are you online you know social it's media or anything this book well, this book and your your oh, okay. thoughts. Okay, um, this book I think it, you can get it as an ebook. Um, I've also organised. I, I also organised a, a workshop on women in war last year in Edinburgh, and I work. I'm organising a work co-organising with my colleague Sarah Cochram and John Gagne in Sydney, uh, a, a workshop in June in Edinburgh on the shadow agents of war. And there's two websites uh, which are uh, which. Uh, highlight the papers and discussion which are going on in those so if anyone's interested they can look at those i suppose they can just google shadow agents of war for example or uh, and, and you'll, you'll find it fairly easily there so that's sort of something that's war related that's um, online mm -hmm. and the book you can find the book on oxford university it's, Press. yeah it's also interesting so you can get it as the ebook or just order it as a uh, expensive hard copy. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Um, no, I think we've, I think we've covered everything. Uh, yeah. I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. This podcast has been presented by war scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or military history podcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H. C R I S on Facebook under War Scholar, on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, and on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.